Councilor with the, uh, the National Council, and uh, you're really participating in uh, this is the second time, the second conference, where we've tried this idea of these brief uh, talks, uh, really modeled after TED Talks. Are you guys familiar with TED Talks at all? You may have seen them on, on the web. Uh, and they're really unlike keynote addresses and workshops where there's like a lot of ideas that are shared. Uh, in an idea talk, the, the real focus is on a, a really important idea, a really big idea. An idea that helps kind of stretch our thinking. And really the formula for a great idea talk is to have terrific speakers who have knowledge, experience, and some insight that helps to stretch our mind a little bit. We're going to start out with, uh, with Richard Clark. Uh, he's the Chief uh, Executive Officer of Magellan Health Services of Arizona. Uh, he leads the Magellan team in managing the Regional Behavioral Health Authority, contract for Central Arizona. Now, he has a lot of responsibilities, including a strategic transformation of the system, a quality outcomes for recipients, compliance, financial performance, and Magellan's relationships with the Arizona Department of Health Services, the legislature, uh, and the community. And the bottom line is Dr. Clark is committed to delivering superior results through his recipient voice, participation, family involvement, and a focus on outcomes, community integration, culturally appropriate attention to recipient race and equity, and collaborative problem solving with providers. And his topic really helps us, I think, really begins to stretch our mind a little bit, to think of things in new ways. And that's really the key to an idea talk. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Clark. What a beautiful place to be doing a poetry reading. I see why my staff, David Covington, is over there taking pictures of me, so I guess that's poetic justice. <laughs> Today I'd like to share a little poetry that inspires my leadership and the leadership of those around me. Uh, I was exposed very early in my life to lots of poetry, and there are many memorable stanzas I can recall. How many of you are familiar with this one? The hurrier I go, the behinder I get. An unexpected paradox for a young child, to say the least. Much of my experience using poetry comes from the time I spent in public urban education, designing adaptive change strategies for urban education reform, and learning that this type of reform requires not a technical solution, but a solution for which people need to change their values, their beliefs, their behaviors, and their attitudes. It requires leaders to engage in new learning. Solutions that reside in others than yourself. And second order change, your own ability to get out of your frame and your own fears and lead. This requires leaders to implement learning strategies techniques for freeing people's energy, and poetry is one of those tools. Now why? Well, number one, research has shown that reading poetry allowed as many physiological positive changes. For example, reading the Iliad out loud causes synchronization of heartbeat and breathing. Brain imagery technology has resulted in understanding greater levels of activity in the brain occur when people listen to poems read out loud. Poetry may even reactivate preferences in the brain for rhythm and rhyme that we developed early in our childhood that really solidifies our memories and draws connection to our current thinking. And lastly, we know that the last hemisphere, the left hemisphere of the brain, is our language center. The right brain plays a role in processing the language of poetry. That is, the more abstract notions, like metaphors and idioms, humor, irony, ambiguity, and connotation. Many of you may be aware of the bibliotherapy and the subset of biblio poetry therapists, where soothing effects of listening to poetry, poetry therapists help their clients to open up and explore life issues in new and meaningful ways. Further exploration of poetry led me to this book, Leading from Within, 
poetry that sustains the courage to lead. In this intriguing book, shows how using poetry, sometimes for something we do not immediately link with leadership, can give leaders a different way of looking at the challenges that face them. Using imagery, figurative language, alliteration, symbolism, and paradox, as we heard at the beginning. Symbolism, in particular, can make a deep and immediate impact. Think of the word wings. For many, this word generates positive connotations of flight, of uplift, of freedom. Because we as a field are engaged in adaptive change, that is, distributing decision making, moving decisions downward and outward to the people responsible for implementing, creating vehicles for voice and participation, it's important for us to find ways to communicate that go beyond the simple exchange of words. Poetry puts us in touch with our values, with our culture, with our feelings. It's charged in meaning. If we want to inspire, clarify, teach, and motivate, poetry can help facilitate that for us. Even in the seminal work, The Leadership Challenge, by Kozes and Posner, quote, in performing the art of leadership, symbols and artifacts are the leader's props. They're necessary tools for making the message memorable and sustainable. Over time, they're a means of keeping the vision and the values present, even when the leader is absent. To illustrate this, I'd like to read three poems from Leading From Within. The first one, Fire, by Judy Brown. What makes a fire burn is space between the laws. A breathing space, too much of a good thing, too many logs, packed in too tight, and douse the flames almost as surely as a pail of water would. So building fires requires attention to the space in between the logs as much as to the wood. When we are able to build open spaces in the same way we have learned to pile on the logs, and we can come to see how it is, fuel and absence of the fuel together make fire possible. We only need to lay a log lightly from time to time. A fire grows simply because the space is there. With openings in which the flame that knows just how it wants to burn can find its way. When was the last time that you tried to make a fire in a meeting? How might you use this poem? Let's consider a stanza from Holly Near, The Rock Will Wear Away. Can we be like drops of water falling on the stone, splashing, breaking, disturbing in the air? Weaker than the stone by far, but be aware that as time goes by, the rock will wear away, and the water comes again. Who or what might the rock be? Social change takes time. Cumulative efforts of many individuals, gentle but persistent souls, a force to create dramatic change. And lastly, How Do I Listen by Hagus. How? Do I listen to others as if everyone were my master, speaking to me his cherished last words? It's amazing how deceptively simple, yet powerful, this short poem is. What was your first impression after reading this poem? I've given you three examples of how we can step outside the routine 
ways of communicating. Simply sharing information is no longer enough. We must look for tools like poetry, rich in symbolism, to inspire, to bring hope, to ensure clarity and understanding. Strategies that ensure the messages are memorable and sustainable. T.S. Eliot's firm belief that good poetry puts together words in a certain way that can elicit emotion and ideas without first requiring intellectual processing. Look for these types of poems, the ones to which you have a gut reaction. I believe you'll be surprised by the connections you develop with your employees, those you serve, and your community.